Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for being here. I apologize for the delay. Had some last-minute updates. Uh, as you know, the President is uh, hosting the U.S. Winter Olympic team uh, today, and I think uh, some members are going to be outside in about an hour, so we'll try to move briskly. And in that spirit, I have no announcements. Nancy. Thanks, Jay. Um, can you tell me if the White House was aware prior to 2014 of this social media network that the AID engineered in uh, Cuba? Well, uh, let me say a couple of things about that. Uh, we've seen the story by the AP this morning. The program referred to by the Associated Press was a development program run by the United States Agency for International Development, and that program was completed in 2012. As you know, USAID is a development agency, not an intelligence agency. Suggestions that this was a covert program are wrong. Congress funds democracy programming for Cuba to help empower Cubans to access more information and to strengthen civil society. These appropriations are public unlike covert action. The money invested has been debated in Congress. In addition, GAO reviewed this program in detail in 2013 and found that it was conducted in accordance with U.S. law and under appropriate oversight uh, controls. In implementing programs in non-permissive environments, of course the government has taken steps to be discreet. That's how you protect the practitioners and the public. Uh, this is not unique to Cuba. So more details about the program uh, are available at USAID, AID, and I think that veterans uh, of this briefing room know that when I say a program like this is not covert and then I talk about it, that's how you know it's not covert, because I'm talking about it. So uh, on the question of uh, the White House, our involvement would, uh, would be the same that it would have been in uh, uh, similar development programs of this type. The President and his administration support efforts to help Cuban citizens communicate more easily with uh, one another and with the outside world. Uh, so I'm not aware of individuals here who knew about it. This was part of uh, a development assistance program. Can you say if Secretary Clinton was, available, was aware of I it? I would refer you to the State Department and Secretary Clinton. And given the enormous lengths that AIB went to to keep this quiet, how can, how can you say it wasn't covert? It was not a covert program. It was debated in Congress. It was reviewed by the GAO. Uh, those kinds of things uh, don't happen to covert programs. It was a development assistance program about, you know, uh, increasing the level of information that the Cuban people uh, have and were able to uh, discuss among themselves, and that's part of an effort that we undertake not just in Cuba but elsewhere. Uh, so again, when you have a program like that uh, in a non-permissive environment, i.e. a place like Cuba, uh, you're discreet about how you implement it so that you protect the practitioners, but uh, that does not make it covert. Do you have any updates on Fort Hood as the President briefed on it this morning? Any new information? On Fort Hood? Uh, well, let me review uh, Fort Hood for you, and uh, including some new information. First and foremost, the President and First Lady's thoughts and prayers uh, go out to the families and friends of the killed and wounded individuals. We commend the military personnel, the first responders, and the medical staff who provided, uh, who responded swiftly to the horrific shooting. The President directed his team to utilize every resource available to fully investigate the shooting. The Department of Defense, as you know, has the lead on the investigation with support from federal partners, including the FBI, as well as state and local law enforcement personnel. Last night, the President convened a conference call with uh, Department of Defense and FBI leadership while aboard Air Force One. Uh, he received another update this morning during the Presidential Daily Briefing. The President will continue to receive updates as new information becomes available and has directed that his team do everything it can uh, to assist the families uh, of the lost and wounded. Yes. Thanks, Jay. Um, the, um, Israel has called off uh, the release of Palestinian prisoners meant to advance the peacemaking process in that region and called for a review of the talks which are sponsored by the U.S. Does that mean this initiative is dead? And um, What's the lesson from that? Well, I've seen the reports uh, that you mentioned, but I can't independently confirm them. I think that was just uh, prior to my coming out here. Uh, I can certainly tell you that um, uh, the decision by the Israelis to delay, to delay the release of uh, the fourth tranche of prisoners creates challenges, uh, and there certainly is currently no agreement uh, on the release of this tranche. 
You know, more broadly, I can tell you that the dialogue remains open, and there has been progress in narrowing some of the questions that have arisen as a result of the events of the last few days. Our negotiating team met with the Israelis and Palestinians together last night. Uh, neither side has indicated that they want to walk away from the talks. Uh, they both indicated they want to find uh, a way to move forward. Uh, so despite the fact that there has been some progress, uh, there's still a gap. And the Israelis and Palestinians must decide whether they will take the necessary steps to close that gap. These are decisions and steps that the United States cannot make. Uh, only the parties themselves can make them. The United States cannot impose an agreement on either side. I think the parties understand what the choices are uh, and the fact that neither the United States nor any other country can make those choices for them. So we will continue working with the parties to try to narrow the gaps and seek a just and lasting resolution uh, to this issue. And if I could say more broadly that we are doing that because it's the right thing to do. It's certainly not the easy thing to do. It's certainly not a path you pursue because you know for sure it will lead to success. In fact, uh, history suggests uh, that getting to success uh, on this particularly difficult issue uh, is very hard. Uh, but it is the responsibility of the United States, the President and Secretary Kerry believe, uh, to provide leadership in this instance uh, to see if the U.S. can help uh, the parties narrow the gaps and move forward towards a comprehensive peace. I know Josh talked mm -hmm. yesterday about the Supreme Court decision, but could you talk about the significance of that and um, uh, whether there's any silver lining in the sense that it may uh, give more par uh, power to party chair people? You know, that kind of discussion is not one I'm going to engage in. Uh, you know, I think Josh reflected our views on it, uh, and I really don't have anything to it add, I wouldn't, again, want to speculate about uh, its impact uh, beyond what Josh said yesterday. Uh, briefly, if I could ask about tonight's meeting with congressional leaders, um, is Ukraine a chief uh, uh, topic in that conversation, and what's the, what do you want to talk about? about? The, pr the President looks forward to the meeting uh, this evening uh, with the four leaders of Congress. Uh, he. Uh, looks forward to briefing the members uh, on his recent trip uh, to Europe, uh, where Ukraine and the challenges posed by Russia's violation of Ukraine's sovereignty um, pose. So that will be the probably principal topic of the discussion. Uh, I'm sure he will also uh, brief the leaders on his meeting with the Pope, uh, which, as you know, was a major part of the trip. Uh, so those are the uh, expected topics of the meeting. Michelle? Um, how would the White House characterize, I, I guess, what progress came out of that European mm -hmm. trip? Because if this is going to be the subject of the meeting tonight. Mm -hmm. So how, how would the administration characterize what came out of that trip? And also, what mm -hmm. has the tone been of the recent conversations with Russia, both um, at the White House level and the state level? I mean, I mean is there sure. any progress at all there, ever? Because it mm -hmm. kind of always seems to be, you know, one step forward, one step back. Well, let me say a few things. First, on the trip, uh, the trip itself was very important because it allowed for the President to meet with leaders of uh, our major European allies, as well as Japan, uh, to uh, discuss the situation in Ukraine and to reach a consensus about uh, our shared views and opposition to Russia's actions and to uh, discuss measures that we can take uh, individually and collectively to make it clear to Russia that the annexation of Crimea is illegal and that you know, we will not participate in any discussion about Ukraine's future without the Ukrainians. We will also uh, work with our partners, as, as, as our partners have made abundantly clear, to impose further costs on Russia should Russia take further action in violation of Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity. As to the status of uh, the circumstances there now, uh, while we have seen reports and claims about uh, drawing down of Russian forces on the Ukrainian border, uh, we have seen no evidence that 
confirms those reports uh, as of yet, and I would point you to uh, the comments by the Supreme Allied Commander, General Breedlove. Um, we, uh, together with our partners, have been uh, taking action to bolster and provide visible reassurance to our central and European allies uh, to make clear that NATO's commitment to Article 5 is unwavering. And we are, as you know, uh, in the aftermath of the President's uh, phone call from President Putin, uh, continuing to engage in a dialogue with Russia over moving uh, down the road of uh, diplomatic resolution. Now, we have been clear what our proposal is, and we have been uh, continuing discussions with the Russians, but uh, I can't report any significant progress at this point. Uh, our, the elements of what has to happen, in our view, are quite clear. Uh, Russia needs to return its forces to pre-crisis positions and levels. Uh, Russia needs to engage in a direct dialogue with the Ukrainian government. Uh, in concert with uh, international partners, uh, and we need to uh, move forward uh, in a mode that de-escalates the tension there. That dialogue between Russia and Ukraine has not been happening, in your view. Yes or, or That's no? That's correct, yes. Okay, thanks. Mr. Scheer. Um, on the torture report, it looks like Congress is going to vote today to send it to to, re to release it essentially and sending it to the declassification mm -hmm. process. What's the president prepared to do to speed up that process so that it can be released to the public? Well, let's be clear. The president has for a long time been on the record that he wants to see that report declassified, right. so and he urged Congress to move quickly. So now they're going to move. So then the question is, what is he going to do to make he sure will, that the bureaucracy uh, release? And is there a time will, period that he wants to put on it for release? Uh, he would expect that uh, the actions that are necessary to declassify a document like that be uh, conducted in uh, all due haste. And, and I think he would make that clear to uh, the agencies involved uh, in that effort and the individuals involved in that effort. Do you, do you have any sense of what all due haste means? I don't have a deadline for you because for the action you're you know, premising the question on has yet to take place. So, John. Uh, Jay, I don't, I don't know if you had a chance to see the comments uh, by Robert Gibbs. He used to stand up there. Um, <laughs> uh, he, he said, uh, quote, I don't think the employer mandate will go into effect. It's a small part of the law. I think it will be one of the first things to go. Mm -hmm. So just a, a couple of questions on that. Do you agree uh, with Mr. Gibbs that the employer mandate is something, we've already seen it delayed twice, <laughs> is something that uh, will ultimately never be put in place? I don't. Uh, as the final rules put out uh, in February made clear, this will be phased in starting next year. This requirement ensures that larger employers either offer quality, affordable coverage to their employees or help offset the cost to taxpayers of these uncovered employees getting tax credits through the health insurance marketplace. This phase-in approach is similar to how the individual mm -hmm. responsibility requirements are already structured. Uh, they start this year and then gradually increase to 2016. Uh, when they are in full effect. You know, I know having spent time on the, uh, at the pundit's table prior to my life here, you know, you can make predictions all the time that turn out not to be true. So, so let's just be crystal clear. I think you were, but let me just clarify. You're saying that the employer mandate requires companies to uh, provide health insurance for their employees will go into effect as scheduled. There will be no further delays. That's correct. The final rules were put out in February. Uh, and this will be phased in starting next year in accordance with the final rules. Are you open to any of the changes that have been proposed by Democrats in Congress to, uh, to, to adjust the mandate at all, or do you think this is the final word that we're... Uh, well, I, you would have to ask me uh, more specifically I, uh, in terms of, A, which requirement you're talking about, which mandate you're talking about. Secondly, uh, what we have seen uh, is uh, this administration act very uh, uh, comprehensively to make sure that the transition into uh, the marketplaces that has been taking effect can be done as smoothly as possible, making adjustment, adjustments as, me as necessary to, uh, to ensure that can happen. Uh, what I think we saw uh, just the other day is that um, despite the problems with the initial rollout of the website, despite uh, some of the other uh, challenges that arose uh, in the uh, rollout of uh, the marketplaces, 
a huge number of Americans responded to the availability of affordable quality health insurance uh, by signing up. And uh, uh, contrary to all the predictions uh, and uh, the clear promises of failure, especially from Republicans, uh, we not only met but exceeded the goal set by outside independent experts, which was 7 million signups by March 31st. So uh, the work continues. As you know, there's a, a not insignificant population of Americans who had begun the process, were either in line physically or uh, via the website uh, in an effort to sign up who did not complete that process by the deadline. And uh, CMS is evaluating that population now and, and moving them through the system so that uh, they can uh, get the insurance that they begin the process to sign up for. So, uh, you know, we're going to continue to implement the law. Do, do you have a sense of how many more are in, are in queue? Uh, I don't, and, and uh, as of yet, they're working through it. And I think uh, to explain uh, why that would be the case, there could be people who uh, went online, were having trouble completing the process, left a phone number, uh, or an email, rather, and then but also called and left. Uh, information so we have to you know there's a work going on to make sure that what exactly the population is how many people there are uh, and uh, and making sure that each individual is able to uh, get processed through the system and then one more from uh, from Robert Gibbs he also uh, was suggesting that there should be an additional layer of coverage cheaper than the plans already uh, being offered is that something that is under consideration here I mean and I asked because he was a sure. day after day while this law was being passed Robert Gibbs mm -hmm. was up there uh, making the case for it, defending it, one of the, you know, I mean, obviously he was here. Well, yeah, time. I mean, there are all sorts of, you know, you know possible uh, improvements that uh, you could put out on the table. And what the President has always said is that he would absolutely entertain uh, specific uh, measures that were designed to improve the law. I mean, I'm not, I, I can't, as a spokesman and not a healthcare policy expert, you know, examine each proposal here from the podium. What I can tell you is that the President has made clear he's uh, open to considering uh, proposals that are designed uh, to improve the law. What we've seen from Republicans uh, have been uh, either all-out repeal efforts or uh, alterations, uh, you know, basically repeal efforts in the guise of, uh, of, of small changes or, or medium-sized changes. when. The purpose, as they state themselves repeatedly, is to repeal the law so that those seven million people, uh, the three million uh, young adults who have insurance through their uh, parents' plans, uh, and the many millions more who have gotten insurance through Medicaid expansion, uh, are all out of luck, and the insurance companies are back in control. Yes, sir. Thank you, Jay. Uh, on Ukraine again, this morning, uh, the deputy uh, Russian Prime Minister uh, Rogozin mocks uh, the <coughs> sanctions that were adopted by the U.S., Canada, and the EU. Mm -hmm. uh, what concrete evidence has the White House that these sanctions really have, uh, have had an impact on, the, on, on, the, on Russia, especially since nothing has happened in Crimea? I think there have been uh, reports uh, uh, that bear out the fact that there has been an impact on the Russian economy as well as on Russian individuals. Uh, as well as on uh, Bankracia, which was one of the, uh, in, which was the institution that was identified in the uh, one of the uh, sanctions uh, put forward by the United States. We've also made clear that should Russia engage in further provocations, take more actions that violated Ukraine's in territorial integrity, sovereignty, that uh, there would be more consequences, more costs, and uh, those would include potentially sanctions uh, aimed at sectors of the Russian economy. The president made clear when he. Uh, announced, signed the executive order authorizing those actions, uh, that implementing such sanctions are not uh, our preferred course of action because uh, implementation of those sanctions would result in some uh, negative impact on the global economy, on the U.S. economy, on the economies of our allies and partners. But as you saw last week when the President was in the Netherlands and Belgium, there is uh, consensus and unanimity among our partners. Uh, that that action would need to be taken should Russia engage in further provocations. I think that Russian officials can say what they like. Uh, the fact is individuals uh, targeted uh, are and will feel consequences from these sanctions. Uh, and certainly uh, if uh, 
more consequential sanctions are levied, or leveled rather, uh, because of actions by the Russian uh, government, uh, those consequences will be felt uh, very keenly. Do we, do we understand that fundamentally the White House expects the Russian, Russian authorities to uh, engage in a dialogue with the Ukrainian authorities, and that would be the <coughs> main fundamental a step to, uh, to, uh, for the White House to accept the, uh, uh, the, the process to go further? Do you understand what I'm talking about? I, I mean, there are a, a series of conditions that we've made uh, clear uh, are necessary for Russia to adopt in order for progress to be made on the diplomatic uh, side of this. And uh, one is pulling back forces to pre-crisis positions and levels. Two, yes, is engaging in a direct dialogue with the Ukrainian government. No decisions can be made and will certainly uh, and no decisions will enjoy the support of the United States or the international community about Ukraine's future without the Ukrainian government participating the Ukrainian people being represented at the table. Uh, you know, that kind of attitude, the suggestion that, that kind of, those kinds of decisions could be made absent representation by Ukraine, uh, harkens back not just to the 20th century, but the 19th century in its thinking. Uh, the U.S. won't participate in that, and neither, were all, were, neither will our allies and partners uh, on the G7 and more broadly in Europe. So I think Russia understands that. Uh, and there is an open dialogue taking place between the United States and Russia. Uh, and uh, I think we, you know, we've made clear what the path forward here is. There's an opportunity that Russia has to uh, embrace that path forward, uh, which also allows for Russian participation in uh, conversations uh, uh, about disputes that it may have with Russia, concerns it, I mean, with Ukraine, concerns that it may have about ethnic Russians uh, in Ukraine, uh, but uh, they need to play by the rules of the road. They need to um, engage with the Ukrainian government uh, and, and do so in a manner that accepts and recognizes that Ukraine is a sovereign state uh, that uh, enjoys the, the rights of all sovereign states under the United Nations Charter and that should not have its territory violated against uh, against the law and in uh, in violation of specific agreements that the Russian government is party to. Mara, yeah. Um, you, you've said that if further <coughs> provocation happens, these <coughs> sanctions would be implemented. And you've also said that the sanctions that have already been in place aren't going to be lifted until Crimea is <coughs> annexed. Um, what I'm wondering is. You've always talked about the Crimea sanctions as giving you flexibility, giving the president flexibility. Do you anticipate a ratcheting up of those sanctions, the sanctions that have already been put on Russia because of Crimea, or are we pretty much finished with those? In other words, the price has been paid and now we're just talking about sanctions that would be put in place if Russia does something more. I think you mean that the executive order, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the first one, right. well, both of them give the president and the United States uh, flexibility. The actions that we've taken uh, in terms of sanctions uh, have to do with Russia's violation already of Ukraine's territorial integrity and sovereignty. Now those authorities exist, and I'm not going to preclude any further action uh, as a consequence of what Russia has already done. The executive uh, orders uh, provide additional authorities to the President, to the administration, to impose further sanctions, as you know. Uh, and the President made clear in his statements that uh, he would avail himself, himself of uh, that authority and those options should Russia further violate Ukraine's sovereignty. So uh, I mean, the answer is I'm not going to rule out further actions uh, in response to what Russia has already done. Uh, I'm going to make clear, as the President did, that the broader authorities uh, uh, created under the second executive order, in particular, uh, are available should Russia uh, take more action against Ukraine. Right, I get that. But you're saying it's also possible that they could pay a higher price for what they've already done. Well, I certainly wouldn't rule it out. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. thanks. Uh, related question. 
Uh, do you have any comment or response? Uh, Russia has uh, imposed a 26 percent increase in the cost of natural mm -hmm. gas to Ukraine. I guess it was done yesterday. Mm -hmm. uh, is that that doesn't seize land or anything, but is that the kind of provocation that would warrant some sort of response either from the U.S. or from the Allies? Or well, we believe, Roger, that markets uh, should determine energy prices and that countries should not use supply and pricing terms as tools of coercion to interfere in Ukraine or anywhere else. Uh, the U.S. is taking immediate steps, as you know, to assist Ukraine, uh, including uh, the provision of emergency finance and technical assistance in the areas, uh, areas of energy security, uh, energy efficiency and energy sector reform. Uh, and we're also working with our uh, allies on, on Ukraine's western borders to encourage them to prepare to reverse natural gas flows in some of its pipelines so that Ukraine can access additional gas supplies if needed. Yesterday, Secretary Kerry and uh, DOE Deputy Secretary uh, Poneman were in Brussels for the U.S.-EU Energy Council meeting. Uh, and together with our partners in Europe, we made clear that energy security, not just for Ukraine, but for all of Europe, is a priority and will require a significant amount of transatlantic cooperation and, and leadership. Uh, so this is something we monitor very closely. We've made clear, as our partners have, that you know, that kind of action taken uh, coercively against Ukraine uh, you know, is something we oppose, and we're working to, with our European partners to uh, assist Ukraine uh, in its efforts to deal with it. Yeah. Hey, on Russia, uh, NASA has said that it's suspending most contact with the Russian Space Agency. Can you talk about the impact of a move like that, which is something we've cooperated with them on for some time? Mm -hmm. And there have been reports about um, how some U.S. spy satellites are Russian-made. Um, there are probably other contracts out there that are impacted. Um, are those under review as well? After we see well, let me tell like you NASA, what is there a broader uh, about look? NASA, that given Russia's ongoing violations uh, of Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity, the U.S. government has taken a number of actions in, to include curtailing official government-to-government -government contacts and meetings with the Russian Federation on a case-by-case -case basis consistent with U.S. national interests. Uh, we've talked about this previously, and as we've already said, we have suspended bilateral discussions with Russia on trade and investment. We have suspended other bilateral meetings on a case-by-case -case basis and put on hold U.S.-Russia military-to-military engagement, including exercises, bilateral meetings, port visits, and planning conferences. We also will not meet with sanctioned individuals. Uh, we have informed the Russian government of those meetings uh, uh, that have been suspended, uh, as you know. Uh, and in terms of the, the specific case-by-case -case decisions that are made uh, in response to this uh, broader directive, uh, you, I would have to refer you to each agency. In the case of NASA, there are uh, some actions being taken, uh, but obviously with the space station and, uh, uh, in particular, that program uh, and uh, the engagement with Russia on that program continues. Um, I want to go back to Fort Hood, and I realize we can't, we don't know all the facts, so we can't prejudge anything and, and, and can't speculate. Uh, but to take a step back, there's been, it's been well documented, it's been talked about by this administration, many in the media, stress on the military, stress on veterans, uh, alarming amount of suicides uh, among returning veterans. Do you think this administration, the previous administration, Congress, both parties, can, can look the American people in the eye and say enough has been done to, to figure this out, to get to the bottom of it. Mm -hmm. How do you address that issue, which is a very tough one to deal with? Well, I think uh, the issue itself uh, is uh, absolutely worthy of the questions you've asked. I want to separate those questions from the particular case which is being investigated because I don't want to uh, prejudge what happened or why it happened at Fort Hood. But I can tell you that the President, Secretary Shinseki, and the Department of Veterans Affairs uh, care deeply for every veteran we are privileged to serve, and that is certainly uh, true of Secretary Hagel and the uniform military leadership at the Pentagon when it comes to active duty personnel. Uh, this administration has been committed to upholding our sacred trust with America's veterans, its wounded warriors, uh, and their families. To go to your question about uh, is there more to be done? Absolutely. Uh, there is work that remains to be done, and the President has taken key steps to ensure that our veterans receive the best health care, get the benefits they have earned, and have access to the education and training they need to re-enter the workforce. He has provided historic levels of support to veterans and their families in his budget requests, uh, and I can uh, list for you the initiatives that this administration has uh, undertaken in the last five and a half years that go right at 
the issue of what we need to do as a country to uh, honor the service of our veterans uh, by making sure that they have uh, our full support. Uh, and uh, you've seen that through the VA, you've seen that in actions uh, that the uh, First Lady and Dr. Biden have led uh, through joining forces. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it reflects the fact that after a decade of war, uh, we need to be very mindful in this country uh, that uh, even as those wars end, our, uh, what we owe our veterans does not end. And uh, the President is personally very mindful of this and has made clear to his administration and his team here at the White House that this is a high priority issue. Yep. Jay, I want to go back to the Cuban Twitter account. You said that the program wasn't covert, and yet one document obtained by the Associated Press said that the program should be kept under the radar to keep it a secret. Another uh, memo written in 2010 by one of the project's creators said, quote, there will be absolutely no mention of United States <coughs> government involvement. So if it wasn't covert, do you acknowledge that it wasn't exactly above board? Well, above board is a loaded term. This was a program that has been uh, invested in and debated in co by and in uh, debated in Congress. Uh, the GAO has reviewed this program in detail uh, less than two years ago and found that it was conducted in accordance with U.S. law and under appropriate oversight controls. Um, when it goes to the question of being very discreet, I don't know if you've been to Cuba. I have. And, uh, a long time ago as a reporter, and you know, these are the kinds of uh, environments where uh, a program like this and its association with the U.S. government can uh, create problems for protect the practitioners and members of the public. So uh, appropriate discretion is engaged in for that reason, uh, but not because it's covert, not because it's an intelligence program, because it is neither COVID covert nor an intelligence program. And again, uh, you guys know because you asked me about covert operations and covert programs on occasion, and you know what my standard response is when I'm asked, which is to say I can't discuss those things. I'm happy to discuss this. Given that it was roping in Cubans many unwittingly, is there something oh, unethical yeah. wait, 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 wait. about it? This was a program that provided a platform for Cuban citizens to uh, share information amongst themselves. That's not, not being roped. Their well, look, for details of how the program extent? works, I would refer you to USAID and the State Department. Data? Again, for details about about how it works, I would point you to the agency that developed it and implemented it. But but I think you ought to be careful about how you describe it. Again, this was not an intelligence program. This was a this was an effort, one of a variety of efforts that the United States engages in uh, as part of its development mission to to promote uh, the, the the flow of free information to promote. Engagement by citizens of countries, especially in societies that are non-permissive, uh, because we believe that is uh, part of the essential right of, of uh, every individual on Earth. So, and that's something that this administration and past administrations uh, have been quite proud of and uh, acknowledge fully in the implementation of a program like this, because of the non-permissive nature of the environment in a country like Cuba. Uh, you know things are handled in a discreet manner, again, to protect practitioners and the public. Does this not harm the reputation of USAID <clears throat> around the world? You mean the publication the by the AP of it? or The, the revelations oh, wow. about this program. I, I think that, again, this was not a covert program. It's a program that has ended. Uh, it's a program that was designed to provide a platform to uh, citizens of that country to communicate among themselves uh, and to uh, have access to uh, information that uh, in societies like that sometimes they don't have access to, or often they don't have access to. And one more um, on the shooting. In the wake of the Navy Yard shootings, um, Secretary of Defense Hagel ordered a series of reviews of the security measures at military installations. Does there need to be another review? Will there be in the wake of this latest incident? Well, we're less than 24 hours since this uh, tragic incident. And uh, there is an active investigation underway being led by the Department of Defense, assisted by the FBI, as well as state and local law enforcement personnel. So uh, I would uh, urge you to wait until uh, 
a little more time has passed as we're dealing with the immediate circumstances of this incident uh, before we can make judgments about that. Carol. I'm sorry, Bill. Do you want? No, Carol and Bill. Just quick. Um, does the president plan to travel to Fort Hood? I don't have any travel updates for you today. Is it possible that he would do that while he's uh, in Texas next week? I, I just don't have, I wouldn't speculate about future travel at this point. Can you um, say how he <clears throat> first like, learned about the shooting and mm -hmm. give us a, a sense of sure. what his reaction was? Sure. Um, the President was informed of the shooting during the event by his Deputy Chief of Staff, Rob Neighbors, uh, during the event he was participating in at the time in Chicago, and was in contact with his Homeland Security Advisor, Lisa Monaco, about details uh, of the event and its aftermath as we learned of them. I'm sorry, during the event it was ongoing and the President was informed of it by Rob Neighbors. His traveling National Security uh, Council staffer, Liz Sherwood Randall, also kept him uh, well informed. And prior to speaking to the press last evening, in which I think, Carol, he, he very clearly uh, conveyed how he felt about the event and what his reaction was to it, um, he uh, was briefed by Vice Chairman uh, of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, Winnefeld. Uh, last night on the way home, as I mentioned earlier, aboard Air Force One, he was briefed uh, by phone by members of his national security team from the White House, DOD, and the FBI, and then this morning he was briefed again during his PDB. Uh, but I think that, again, if you look at what the President said as this, uh, right after this event had happened, I think you can uh, assess how he felt about it. Uh, it is heartbreaking when an incident like this happens. And uh, we're obviously in very early stages uh, of an investigation, uh, so we can't reach conclusions about the hows and whys, but uh, you know there are families now who have lost loved ones and whose loved ones have been uh, injured, uh, and uh, the president's thoughts and prayers, the first lady's thoughts and prayers, and the thoughts and prayers of all of us here go out to those families. The Bill. discussion over the last couple of days, not of <coughs> Pollard and Israeli-Palestinian negotiations, you suggested that that is something that the Israelis always bring up. But there are also suggestions that the U.S. offered this as a way to get the negotiations back on track. Is that the case? Uh, Bill, what I can affirm to you is that uh, the issue of Jonathan Pollard and uh, his disposition is something that uh, has been frequently raised by Israeli officials. Uh, and all I can tell you is that the President has not made a decision to release Mr. Pollard uh, and that he is continuing to serve uh, his sentence, uh, having been convicted of espionage. Was his release something that the United States suggested in order to move forward? Again, it would be hard for us to suggest something that is raised uh, with some frequency by uh, the Israelis. So, well, again, it's, it has been raised frequently, and I don't think anybody who covers these issues would dispute that, uh, by, uh, by the Israelis. So uh, having said that, I'm not going to get into the conversations and discussions and negotiations that Secretary Kerry has had with uh, with the parties. You, uh, not you, but has the administration asked the Samsung Corporation to stop tweeting that selfie? <laughs> uh, what, without getting into Council's discussions, I can tell you that as a rule, the White House objects to attempts to use the President's likeness for commercial purposes, and we certainly object in this case. Uh, look, we, it, it does stand to reason. We have objected in the past. We object now, but I'm not going to get into, you know, the manner of objection, objection except for the manner I just uh, delivered it. Yeah, Mark. Uh, Jay, are you saying the White House Council is in touch with Samsung? Well, I think I just said, Mark, that I'm not going to get into the Council's discussions, uh, but I will tell you that as a rule, <laughs> but as a rule, <laughs> It's discreet. It's discreet. Uh, as a rule, the White House objects to attempts to use the President's uh, likeness for commercial purposes. And when you speak of releasing Pollard, you mean commutation of a sentence, right? You don't mean a pardon. I'd refer you to the Department of Justice for his status, uh, and I'm not going to get into the uh, details of conversations that Secretary Kerry has had with the parties. Yes, sir. You said earlier that uh, the president would do whatever he can to see that the 
uh, Senate Intelligence Committee's report about enhanced interrogation gets out to the public, if you will. How unequivocal, though, is that? Is, he's the president. Is he willing to tell the agencies to stop resisting the, the release of this kind of information, other than going, obviously, over the report line by line? Well, again, the president, I think, stood before you and made very clear, as I and others had already done, that he uh, wants this uh, work by Congress to be completed. He wants the report to be submitted for declassification, for that request to be made. Uh, and uh, he uh, will ensure that the administration acts responsibly in the uh, obviously sometimes complicated work of declassifying uh, these kinds of documents, but uh, with dispatch. So, I mean, I can't, again, there's a process in place here, and you're jumping ahead three steps. We need to see Congress uh, finish its work and make a request for declassification. The President has made clear as I have I and others, uh, that he wants to see that done and he will, uh, he call, he, he wants the report declassified so that the public can see it. Let me jump back one step then. Mm -hmm. Is he interested in seeing this report himself? Uh, I, yes, sure. The answer is yes. Um, I don't think that we have seen the report. There was an early, uh, you know, I, I would refer you to the processes up there, but we have not uh, seen the final report, certainly. Okay. Tommy uh, and Leslie. Thanks, Jay. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of a broad question, but uh, you know, here we have another uh, mass shooting, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, well, Jason, what would you say to people who are just demoralized at the prospect that anything will ever be done at the federal level to, to fight gun violence after after each one of these mass shootings, after all the effort that went into even passing background checks that had 80, 90 percent support from the American people and, you know, nothing got done. Here we are again. What, what do you say to people who are just demoralized by that? Possibly? Well, Tommy, as I, as I said earlier in answers to questions about this, I want to separate out this specific incident and the circumstances around it because we don't know the facts yet. I certainly don't know all the facts yet. Uh, so I, I don't want to have comments I make about the, the broader tub, uh, subject. Uh, be suggestive of anything specific about that incident. What I can say is that the President made abundantly clear his disappointment and frustration with uh, Congress and its failure to listen to the uh, overwhelming majority of the American people when they made clear they wanted to see the background check system uh, made more effective and expanded. Uh, that was a proposition that in no way violated our Second Amend Amendment rights, rights which the President supports. Uh, and. The President also made clear at the time uh, that he would continue uh, uh, executing on the broader uh, plan that the Vice President and he developed to reduce gun violence in America, uh, which included, in addition to pushing that specific piece of legislation, a number, uh, more than 20 executive actions that the administration uh, could take, and there has been action on all of them as well as some additional ones. So uh, I think that there is certainly reason to be frustrated, as the President was and is, by the failure of Congress to act on something so common sense. Uh, but uh, that doesn't mean you uh, give up on efforts that uh, remain possible. And that's why the President has taken the steps he's taken uh, and uh, will continue to look for ways to uh, implement common sense uh, solutions to this very challenging problem. Leslie. So you said the um, USA Cuba program was run discreetly, not covertly, um, but did, are, now that it's sort of out there uh, publicly, are other concerns about how this will affect efforts to get Alan Gross released? And can you talk about whether or not he was um, involved in it? Well, yeah, let me make clear. Alan Gross was in no way affiliated with this program. Mr. Gross has been imprisoned by Cuban authorities for more than four years for doing nothing more than helping Cuban citizens gain access to the Internet. We continue to work to secure his release. Mr. Gross is a 64-year-old husband, father, and dedicated professional with a long history of providing aid to underserved communities in more than 50 countries. We reiterate our call uh, on the Cuban government to release uh, Alan Gross. His detention remains an impediment 
to more constructive relations between the U.S. and Cuba. Uh, so uh, we're continuing our efforts. It certainly should not. He was in no way affiliated with this program. This program, again, was debated in Congress, reviewed by the GAO, uh, not covert, not an intelligence program. And then uh, Alan Gross was not even affiliated with it. Uh, he should be released. And, and the, the failure of the Cuban government to release him thus far has uh, continues to be an impediment uh, towards uh, improved relations between the U.S. and Cuba. Follow Jessica? Follow up on that. Follow. I, I, I have a follow on the detention. Um, I'm just wondering, amongst the President's support on that, what are his thoughts about how— On, on which? I'm sorry. Uh, sorry, CIA detention. See if the CIA yes. report released mm -hmm. declassification. As part of his thinking on that, does he have a, a sense that by releasing and declassifying parts of that report, it could have a positive impact on international relations with countries that have been particularly critical of the policies of Gitmo detention, CIA mm -hmm. inter interrogation. Uh, yeah. Jessica, I haven't had that conversation, at least from that angle, with him. Uh, he believes that the American people should uh, know as much as possible about these practices, which it's very important to note he ended immediately upon taking office. So uh, he's more focused on uh, the importance of the American people having access to uh, this report once it's been appropriately declassified. Uh, but uh, I think that the fact that he ended these programs, the fact that he has uh, fought and continues to fight to close <coughs> the Gitmo facility, uh, I think around the world, uh, his administration's policies and uh, his efforts uh, are pretty well understood in this regard. Uh, so the focus here is on uh, making sure the American people are able to see the report uh, in a declassified fashion. Jared. Jay, uh, Josh said yesterday in the gaggle that the U.S. were disappointed by the McCutcheon decision. Will the President solicit donations from people who have already given $123,200 in this cycle? You know, I refer you for questions like that to the DNC. Uh, the, the disappointment that Josh expressed yesterday still stands. I, I just don't have answers to questions. Well, the President could uh, encourage other Democrats to I don't donate have or to that. solicit those donations. Uh, sorry, I would refer you to the DNC. After the Priorities USA Super PAC, after the President turned that decision around two years ago, the justification given in the 2012 cycle was that this wasn't a quote, but did, that to not do so would be bringing a knife to a gunfight. Does the President feel like by not soliciting contributions, he would be. Jared, I appreciate all the questions, and there are people who are uh, in position to answer them. Uh, and certainly, we're talking about a ruling that came down yesterday, and uh, you know, I think that our folks are digesting it. So I just don't have any new information along, uh, or new positions along those lines to to raise with you today. But the disappointment that was expressed doesn't uh, will not be expressed in a promise not to solicit those Jared. funds. I don't know how many times I can tell you. I just don't have anything new for you on it. Uh, it's been uh, a very short time since the decision came down. Uh, we've expressed our disappointment with the decision, but I don't have anything beyond that for you. Chris. Okay. Thanks, Jay. The uh, Mississippi legislature approved this week a bill that critics say would enable discrimination or allow people to, serve, people to refuse services to LGBT people on religious grounds in that state. It's along the lines of the controversial Arizona bill that was vetoed mm -hmm. by Jan Brewer. Does the President want to see a veto of this legislation? No, I haven't uh, seen a lot of detail on that uh, situation, so I would not be able to comment uh, directly on it. We certainly thought that uh, the Governor of Arizona did the right thing by vetoing that bill, uh, but I, I don't know the particulars of this particular action. And development on that uh, <coughs> contemplated executive order barring LGBT workplace discrimination. Uh, Democratic National Committee Treasurer Andy Tobias said in an email to LGBT donors that uh, he agrees that it should be signed and that its absence is, uh, is frustrating. Uh, if those are the words coming from the Democratic National Committee Treasurer at a time when he's trying to raise money, keep the President's party in power in the midterm elections, mm -hmm. is there a problem? I, I think that there are a lot of strongly held views on these matters. The President believes very strongly in employment non-discrimination. That's why he has urged Congress to act on the uh, end of legislation. Uh, 
Uh, we've seen some progress on that. We, uh, it needs to be completed. Uh, those who oppose it uh, are standing in the way of history and will look uh, foolish uh, in the future uh, as future generations look back at that stance and recognize it for what it is. The, I just don't have any updates for you uh, on uh, the EO that you mentioned. Let's say the end of this become law. The Congress approves it and the, Congress approves it and the uh, President signs it. Would that change the President's thinking on signing the executive order? I think the Employment Non-Discrimination Legislation, the Employment Non-Discrimination Act, would broadly apply. Uh, and that's uh, one of the reasons why uh, we support it, because it's a broad solution to the problem. Uh, and it ought to be passed by Congress. But I'm not going to engage, I mean, why are you, I, you're sort of scrunching your face as if a law wouldn't apply to some citizens, it would apply. I'm just so curious because that there are, uh, there's an I think it's a law passed. Now I'm not a lawyer, uh, and I'm not, I don't, I haven't read every uh, sentence of the law, but I think if a law passed that broadly banned this kind of employment discrimination, uh, it would make redundant uh, an executive order. But there are some instances where would that not be the case because the executive order. Well, applies. that could be hypothetically, but I think we'd like to see the legislation passed, and uh, that would be a good thing. Yeah. Brett. Oh, thanks, Shane. Uh, I want to ask I think we're going to, I got to, this has got to be the last one because I want to make sure you all get the Olympians. The, the situation with the uh, Iran and the UN ambassador, the appointments there, I want to ask uh, uh, the White House's view on that and also if it's going to affect the nuclear negotiations at all. Uh, well, on the P5 plus 1 negotiations, they are focused on a very specific task, and, uh, which is to see if we can resolve diplomatically the challenge posed by uh, Iran's nuclear program. Uh, that is in the interest of the United States, the interests of the region and our allies around the world, and we will continue to pursue that. Uh, any uh, resolution of that diplomatically would have to be one that provides uh, transparency and validation uh, to the necessary commitment by Iran to forsake nuclear weapons and the development of nuclear weapons. Uh, so as has been the case when we have talked about other issues with which we have great disagreements uh, with Iran, like Syria and its sponsorship of terrorist organizations, uh, we do not let up on Iran uh, in terms of the pressure we place on it on those matters. Uh, on the issue, I think I've addressed the question of the uh, individual and the and the uh, ambassador uh, appointment of the uh, of an ambassador to the United Nations. I don't have anything to add on that. But on the issue of P5 plus one, uh, we continue to pursue that with our partners, and uh, you know that does not change. Those will be viewed totally separately. Then. That's why I think I made that clear. Thanks very much.